right, well, uh, we'll get started with our 12 o'clock briefing today, uh, the title of which is Sea Lions, Right Whales, and Killer Whales as Key to Conservation. Uh, I'd like to introduce our, our speakers here today. They'll each deliver uh, a few minutes of, uh, of opening remarks, and then we'll open the floor to questions from all of you. Uh, first to speak will be Francis Gulland, Commissioner of the United States Marine Mammal Commission. Second is Joseph Gatos, Science Director and Veterinarian of CDOC Society, which is a program out of the University of California, Davis. And third, Michael Moore, a senior scientist and veterinarian at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, institution, excuse me. And we'll be, get started with Francis. Well, good afternoon. Um, so I think everyone's familiar with marine mammals, large, iconic, charismatic animals. And because the public really loves these animals, um, there have been um, legal protection for them in many countries. There's a world moratorium on commercial whaling to protect whales. And because of these laws, many marine mammal populations have come back, and we evaluate really conservation success through counting animals and saying that we have healthy populations. But the three of us here today are actually all veterinarians, so when we think of health, we actually think of individual animals and what is their health status. Do they have diseases? Do they have traumatic lesions? So what we're going to do today is really take you through how we look at these individuals how we see um, what the state of their welfare is, if they have infectious disease, and then how that translates into ways to protect the population and also um, give us insight into the state of the ecosystem that they live in. Marine mammals are top predators. They can give us clues into ecosystem changes because they're actors, integrators. So I actually work with California sea lions, mostly in California, and that's an example of an animal um, that's really recovered with legal protection. There are now over 200,000 California sea lions, and they don't really interact um, with commercial interests of, of, of people in an industry. So therefore, I can do what I, I do want to do as a vet. I examine their health, I look at stranded animals, I find they have diseases that are due to harmful algal blooms. I can publish those results, I talk to public health, health communities in California and say these diseases could also impact people and we do things to protect people like close the Dungeness crab fishery and protect people at some economic um, cost. In contrast, we have animals that um, are in conflict with commerce and both speakers will talk about two populations. And recently I was working with the vaquita, which is the Mexican porpoise now on the edge of extinction because those animals are drowning in gill nets set by an illegal fishery that poaches totoaba and sells the fish for over $8,000 a kilo in China. So um, what our messages really are today is that we can examine individual marine mammals, we can care about them as vets, we care about their welfare, their conservation, we can find diseases, we get insights into ecosystem changes, we can publish those results, we can communicate those with government agencies, but unless there's a real political will to um, affect, to, to create laws and to have policies that are acceptable to, to commerce and the voting population, we aren't succeeding. And we are about to lose the vaquita. It's on the face of extinction. We have two other species we'll hear about today that are facing um, threats to their existence. And so with that, I'd like to hand over to my two veterinary colleagues Take the um, clicker to give examples of woe. And there's Dr. Gulland with the California sea lion doing a, doing a thing. electroencephalogram. Um, so I'm going to talk about the southern resident killer whale population, which is a local population of killer whales that numbers 73 right now. They're a salmon-eating specialist, primarily Chinook salmon, which is the largest of the five sam native uh, salmon that occur in this area. And uh, this population, we know very well that the Major problems we have are high contaminant burdens, and these are legacy persistent organic pollutants in these animals. They have a decreased amount of salmon availability. We've been decreasing salmon runs by um, altering habitats, overfishing, uh, putting in hydroelectric for over 200 years now. And then the other thing is that they um, suffer from vessel disturbance, especially vessel noise. So when salmon are already scarce, they're acoustic animals, and they use sound to find those scarce salmon. When the ocean is noisy, it's even harder for them to find salmon in there. 
Um, and what we're trying to do is learn more about the health. So you'll hear over and over again in the news that these animals are starving. And, um, and they are suffering from lack of uh, prey availability and lack of ability to find that already scarce prey. Uh, but some work that we just did looked at 10 years of stranding data from killer whales and uh, recognizing that we only see about 20%. These are, whales are all known individually. And so when an animal dies, we can look back and we can say, out of all the animals that have died, we've only found 20% of those animals that end up on the beach here. And this is a um, necropsy done by Dr. Ravity, who's also in the room here. And uh, what we found interesting in this data set, out of 53 animals we looked at over 10 years, and, and they're so scarce, we actually were looking at animals, all different types of killer whales from Alaska all the way down to California and out to Hawaii. And what we did find that was interesting is that we were finding a lot of diseases that people don't talk about. We were finding things like like this is a traumatic wound uh, from a boat strike. We were finding congenital diseases in animals. We were also finding animals had fisheries interactions where they had halibut hooks in their stomach or things like that, things that people don't necessarily talk about. And so when you have a population that numbers 73 animals, it is really critical that we recover salmon populations and Chinook populations. It's really critical that we reduce noise so they can find already scarce salmon. But when you have a population that's that small, we also think that it's the time we should also be thinking about the health of individual animals and what can we doing at that level. And so this is a picture of a, a four-year-old southern resident killer whale a couple years ago who was very small. And you can see that the fat is lost all around the neck, and you can almost see the spine. And you should never really see that on a killer whale. It should just be kind of a fus fusiform shape. And we're unable to save this animal, but at that time, the popular discussion was that animal's starving, we need to feed that animal. But I think looked at the, looking at these um, necropsy findings, there are a lot of things that could be going on. This animal could have had a congenital malformation in its stomach. This animal could have swallowed a fish hook when it was depredating lines. This animal, you know, there were other things that could be going on with this animal. And so attempts just to say feed an animal are not really kind of a, a one-shot solution on that. And I think that as, a, as efforts move forward, Right now, you know, in U.S. and in Canada right now, there have been really great efforts moving forward to try and uh, decrease noise, increase salmon, keep removing contaminants out of the system. While we're waiting for all of those solutions, I think we also need to be working on individual animal health and looking at it where we do know every single one of these animals and we do have the possibility to, to intervene under certain, certain situations. Thanks, Joe. So I'm going to talk about... Uh, North Atlantic right whales. Uh, this one you can see is entangled. This toy here is quite anatomically accurate. They often swim through the water with their mouths open, filter feeding on krill. And where they get into trouble is either being hit by ships, and we've got a lot of ship mortality over the decades that we've been monitoring them, but we also see a lot of fishing gear entanglements. And the entanglements are particularly the case for vertical rope in the water column where the rope is hanging there. There's a buoy at the surface for the trap that's on the bottom to pull it back up with lobster trap, crab trap, snow trap, snow crab traps. So as they, as they go through the water, the, the whales swim along with their mouths open feeding. And what happens is they, they hit the gear and they panic and they tend to roll. And so you get this gear that they'll then swim away with. They do some more rolling and you might get it around the flipper here and then through the baleen and then back around the tail. And they might get a little bit hogtied, and they're still towing gear and trying to swim. Now, as an individual and as a species, this is bad news. As the individual from an animal welfare point of view, obviously, and from the species point of view, uh, you don't do very well as a species if you're either chronically entangled or you're dying from the entanglement and you're going to drown. So if you compare this with um, southern right whales, the sister species down in the southern hemisphere, they, they were knocked down by whaling to very much the same level, a few hundred animals. And this is all prior to, say, 1930. Most of it was a good deal of time before that for the North Atlantic right whale. But what's happened to the southern right whale is they've grown up to about 25,000 animals now, and we're still in the low hundreds for these guys. Right now, there are about 400. There were 500 10 years ago. So we've lost 20% of, of the species in the last decade. So given that, what's going wrong and what can we do about it? Well. One of the things that happened in those last 10 years is that the warming of the Gulf of Maine sent the food, the copepods, up into the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And so Canada, which was relatively naive in terms of, of the risks up there, had a bunch of ship strikes and some entanglements, and we've continued to have issues down in the U.S. as well. 
So given that, I've tried to get my head around uh, what we're doing and what we're not doing. And we've, we've, for this meeting, I put together this um, the right whale vortex, I guess is the way we've called it. And if this, the tube down which that red whale is falling is the bad place to be, and the, the circumference around the outside is the place where we can turn things around. So foraging and migration, a critical piece, trauma, vessels, entanglement, noise, on the right-hand side there, and then ultimately, and the piece that we've really been ignoring is the issue of reproduction and reproductive health and, and carving and rearing success. And so as long as you stay on the outside ring in each of those situations, then you're going to do pretty well because the um, no trauma, more calves, successful foraging and migration all add, add up to recovery. And <coughs> one of the things that struck me over the years, and I sit on the Atlantic Scientific Review Group, uh, for the NOAA uh, process of looking at the stock assessment every year, is the body counting. The, what they're looking at is the mortality, because the government rules say that you shalt not kill more than one right whale a year. We do that every year. But what it doesn't do is look at these animals that have been entangled <coughs> for a while. They didn't die, but they were, they, they were stressed up, and they got scarred up, and they got damaged. And then either they got released again by humans, or they will wriggle out of it and then continue to go about their business. But we've done some calculations where when you're towing the gear like this, it's, it's damaged, but it's also drag, so that maybe around the tail and it's pulling a few traps behind it. And we've calculated that the, the cost of that drag, on average, is the equivalent to getting pregnant. And on the basis of that, you can't do both. And so the sublethal trauma is something that's just as important as the lethal trauma. And if you look at the regs, they really don't look at that to nearly such an extent. And so and I've tried to say this to fishermen, is, you know, what you really want to worry about is if we can actually get more whales, because then it's going to be how do we sustain that and keep on going. And so it's really a question of broadening all of the changes that have been attempted to reduce this mortality into the sublethal mortality mitigation, taking care of the health of the individuals that we haven't yet killed. So that's um, the, the real question that I'd like to bring forward. And on the basis of the um, entanglement problem, where we're at is a really exciting time because for 20 years there's been this, or 30 years, scientific industrial defense technique to bring gear back from the bottom without pulling on a rope. You hit a button, acoustically you trigger it and up it comes. And that's, that's routine for much of this ocean of science you may have seen here this last few days. In contrast, the traps are still retrieved simply by pulling on a line. So there's a buoy at the top and it marks the buoy it tells other people where the buoy is and also enables the fisherman to pull it up. So any acoustic alternative has to do those three things. And so an acoustic pinger on the trap at the bottom will show up on the plotter on the ship to identify it and tell others where it is, and you can also then release it to bring it up. And so there are commercially available uh, products both with buoyant line re re released from the trap or a, an inflatable bag. There's a group in in Washington State here who've got this lift bag idea that works. And you know, we're, we're about to spend money on, on both of those technologies to test with the local fishermen in Massachusetts, both inshore and offshore, over the next 12 months. And the attitude for the fishermen is improving. You know, they're, they're beginning to look. And where it's working is it is enabling them back into closed areas, because then there's a positive incentive. There has to be much more investment as subsidies from the government to make it work. The consumer needs to be better educated and the consumer needs to be driving and be willing to pay the extra for the cost of sustainable seafood because ultimately any seafood that's caught in a trap on the east coast of the US is not sustainable. Whether you read it that it is or it's not, it isn't. So this guy needs your help. Thank you. Thanks to our speakers. Uh, we'll open the floor to questions now. And uh, a microphone will be brought to you. So uh, up front, Val. Thank you. Robin Williams, ABC Australia. Joseph, uh, orcas, are they territorial? Do many of them just move out the way to different places, or are they restricted? Uh, the, the, they seem to be restricted to certain areas, and even within certain areas, we can have multiple types of orcas. So in this area within the Salish Sea, we have ones that specialize in Chinook, 
or salmon. We have ones that specialize in eating and killing and eating marine mammals. We have ones that specialize in actually eating sharks. And those animals tend to have areas that they use, but they can overlap, but they use them independently. No, they really don't move away. They kind of have their own patterns that they go through, almost like you want to think of elephants. So, hey, this is where we go get at water. This is where we go to forage. And then they have this historical, um, almost a culture that scientists call it now, where old females who are reproductively senescent, postmenopausal, actually add a lot of value to that population because they can remember, hey, I remember... 60 years ago, when we didn't have food, we actually went down here to that area. So that information is passed on, just as an elephant may remember, hey, when I was a kid, there was a drought, and we went here. I'm Alan Boyle with GeekWire. I wanted to ask Joseph, uh, recently there was some discussion of uh, what might be a presumed orca death, L41. And uh, I wondered if you could uh, provide any sort of update on on that uh, issue or question mark, and, and also maybe a little more general about what sorts of policies uh, are being put into effect, perhaps, to, to help the orca population. I know that the state has uh, done some work to try, to try to put together some policies. Yeah, I can't, unfortunately, I can't comment too much on, on the missing adult male. Um, other than I haven't heard that he's been seen, and usually the Center for Whale Research who calls that out, it's pretty rare that they'll call an animal missing and have that animal show up again. Um, it's a rare occurrence on that. So that's all the detail that I have on that. Um, in the U.S. and in Canada right now, uh, thanks to some effort um, by Governor Inslee in Washington State with the ORCA Task Force, um, there are efforts underway now to slow ships down to move boats further away from whales when they're whale watching. There is increased funding right now to try and um, uh, bring back salmon. Some of that has to do with habitat restoration and bringing back wild salmon, and then some of it is what I consider a stopgap measure of having hatchery fish, more hatchery fish put out there. Um, and so those same sorts of things are being done in Canada, but sometimes to different levels. So in Canada right now, they, they actually have a uh, temporary ban on watching southern residents for commercial groups. So if you sign a thing saying that you're not going to watch southern residents, you can get closer to the transients or the marine mammal eaters there. They also have these ship shut, shut down areas, complete closures. They have some fishing closures, some of them being regional and place-based. Um, so there are a couple of reports, and I'm happy, happy to send you both of those reports on that. Um, thank you. Mary Miller from the Exploratorium. Um, in, in terms of ship noise, um, ferries are an extremely important form of transportation in Seattle. We're talking about in San Francisco Bay Area, increasing ferries. Is there a technology that helps reduce the noise or reduce the um, impact um, strike, say, going to electric ferries that might help with climate change as well, win-win yeah. kind of thing? Yeah, I'll let Michael talk about that as well. But basically, to reduce one of the biggest things you can do to reduce noise is to slow ships down. And so slowing ferries down, and there was some, I can't remember if it actually came into legislation or not, but slowing ferries down when they're around southern residents, I think, was one of the issues that was brought up. Washington State is going to bring on its first electric ferry to deal with the climate change. Climate change is also a big threat because it uh, affects salmon and things like that as well, um, and ocean acidification that associates with that. So they are slowly bringing in electric ferries, and then they're slowing ferries down um, as well. And Michael, if you want to comment on that, because that's a big issue with the, the North Atlantic right whales. Yeah, that was the that's the idea that they can quiet them down. Yeah, and fuel-driven ferries of ships in general can be designed to be quieter. Noise is a waste of energy, and so Maersk and other big shipping companies are looking very closely at how they build their ships to make them more efficient, and when they do that, they'll be quieter as well. So oh, Nathaniel Hertzberg, I work for Le Monde. Uh, it's a question from Michael. Uh, how do you explain that the, the success story that happened to gray whales didn't happen 
to write whales at all. <laughs> and um, and this the yeah, that's mainly th mainly that. The second thing I was thinking, why gray whales don't seem to suffer as much of entanglement and and ship contact and. Well, the gray whale lady is Francis more than me. Oh, but that's, <laughs> I wonder for, sure. for, on your point of view. Yeah, from my point of view, I don't know much about gray whales, but um, it, it ultimately comes down to the persistent exposure to anthropogenic stress. And so, and those are very niche-based in terms of how a particular whale species falls into, in the right whale's case, the trap of those that damage and so the east coast i think is probably more industrialized the, the 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 there's much more continental shelf so there's a lot more uh, trap based fishing um and there's an awful lot of shipping now most of the shipping for the west coast tends to be transcontinental transpacific and so it's going to be coming in and out at a straight angle whereas a lot of the fuel movement and uh, container ships uh, are coastal on the east coast and really it's it's the density of the of the fishing gear especially so if you look at some of the areas that these right whales are, are conflicting with fishing gear there's nothing trophic about it it's simply that the food i mean uh, so humpback whales in Newfoundland in the 70s, they were going at codfish that were feeding on the capelin. That the, the, the humans were going after the codfish, the whales were going after the capelin, but they were all on the same trophic uh, web there. And so that was a very dis direct conflict. But it's, it's, the right whales is much more indirect. They're after copepods, uh, but the, um, the fishermen are after lobster. But it's, it's really... You have to look at each species in terms of the specifics of how the interaction is going on. And obviously the gray whales are having less of a interaction with issues that they do get entangled, but not so much. And they've also um, you know, got a different biology into how, how it works. I'm sure Francis can add to that. Mm -hmm. uh, I would actually add that it's, I think we get very deeply into complexities very quickly. And it's really quite simple where you have an overlay of crab lines in the water or you have an overlay of shipping and you have whales, they die or they get chronically injured. And so, so the question really is why has there been more overlap for North Atlantic right whales versus gray whales? And, and we've seen some really interesting changes that are associated with climate change. Um, Michael alluded to right whales moving further north um, into Canadian um, snow crab fishing areas recently and therefore they started to die in through interactions with a Canadian snow crab fishery that then adds the politics of US versus Canadian fisheries. On the west coast, um, the Dungeness crab fishery is, is a fishery that um, the fishermen aren't just crab fishermen and have done it for three generations. They actually also fish for salmon. They, take, they go out for halibut. They do different things at different times of the year. So typically, they have um, gone out for Dungeness crab in uh, November, December, January, before the whales arrive. And because of the large harmful algal blooms off the West Coast, the crab fishery was closed because of our work on other marine mammals showing that um, sub low levels of domoic acid in crabs could affect um, developing fetuses. The crab fishery was closed for November, December, January until the domoic acid was cleared from the crabs, which then meant that these fishermen were now going for crabs in... February, March, April, which was when whales were then in the area. So we had a huge increase in whale entanglements, both gray whales and humpback whales, in the two years following a harmful algal bloom, simply because the timing of the crab fishery had changed. Um, so it's, it's, it's spatial overlay. It, yeah, it is. Whales and people in the same place don't do well unless we're prepared to, to give. Uh, and the North Atlantic versus the Southern right whale comparison is even more stark. <coughs> I told you that they came right, way back fast. And one critical statistic is that 80% of the human race lives in the Northern Hemisphere. 80% of the human race lives in the Northern Hemisphere and 65% of the land mass. And so the human interactions in the Southern Hemisphere whale species is way, way less than it is up here. Hence, they've been able to grow so fast yeah. since they stopped whaling on them. 
And that actually feeds into the concept that we'll talk about later of the global stranding network is to today, humans are in the north and some of the more interesting and diverse marine mammals are in the subtropics and the tropics and Antarctica. And as human populations expand, as there's more coastal fishing, we're beginning to see threats to small dolphin populations in the subtropics and the tropics, but we don't have networks of people there to respond to sick animals, to do health <coughs> investigations. So we're seeing sort of a conservation crisis for those animals without the resources to investigate or, or protect their health. So there's a paper recently out about the dirty dozen, the next 12 small dolphins that are likely to go extinct. And they're all dolphins in West Africa, Southeast Asia, that are um, dying in artisanal coastal fisheries. And some of them are running out of rivers to swim in. And running out of rivers. You know, I mean, that's the, this <laughs> meeting in Barcelona we were at last December was the most shocking thing was many of these river dolphins, if you can save them from the entanglement, but the water uptake is so such that the... There's no river to swim in, and as a as a marine mammal or as an aquatic mammal, that's really tough. My question is for Joseph, I think, but maybe all of you can answer. You you mentioned individual. Oh, my name is Jordan Keitha, Urban Wilderness Project. You mentioned attention to individual animals, and I'm thinking about. Um, I can't call her number, the one who carried her dead orca. Yeah, Talegua. Mm -hmm. And I, I did wonder, and I wonder if there's any information, why we didn't take her. Because I felt like she was saying, take my baby, and no. Given the interactions she's had for years with the researchers. So that's part of my question. But if they're well, how would you do non-invasive care of them? As veterinarians, yeah, that's a really good good question, Jordan. So with Talequa, this was a, a a female who gave birth to a calf um, about a year and a half ago, and the calf died right after being born, and then she carried that calf probably for a thousand miles. Um, and there were discussions occurring every day when some people were saying, "Hey, we should take the calf. We should necropsy it. We should find out why that animal died." And other people were saying, "No." that's not fair for us to do. That's her calf. And every time she goes down, um, you know, that to catch a fish or whatever, she's has to drop that calf and go back and get it again. And she's making the decision to carry that calf. And so I think the decision ultimately came down to the management agencies who said, this is what she wants to do with it. We should just let her do that with it. And so the calf was, was never recovered on that. With the individual animals, I think that's a, another big question with, with J50, that one I showed a picture of. A lot of people were saying at that time, capture that animal and, and do something. And other people were saying, you are stressing that animal out by being out there. And then some people, we were darting long-term antibiotics into that animal because we found a lot of these animals that strand die of bacterial pneumonia. And people were saying, gosh, quit experimenting with the antibiotics. And people are saying, what are you doing just giving one little dose? You should be doing a whole medical workup. So there's definitely conflict in what we should be doing. And I think the idea of that you brought up is what can we do hands off? I think that's really where we are right now is, you know, how much data can we collect without those animals even knowing that? And the beauty of this uh, drone photography is that we can look at body condition now and the animal doesn't even know that the drone is up there can actually come in, you can take a breath sample from those animals, and those animals don't even flinch at all. And then developing new technology. So, you know, if you think of uh, proteomics, when there's a very small interface between the lung and the blood. And so there are probably a lot of proteins and things that are there. You can get out a breath sample, just like we do on most dogs and cats and other animals getting out of a blood sample. So if we could develop those techniques, we could actually have a drone collected breath sample and then look at things like liver enzymes, kidney enzymes, you know, other indicators of health like that. And so I think that's the goal is to be as hands off, as non-invasive as possible as so to not be part of the problem, but to be part of the solution, even limiting the amount of time that researchers' boats are in the area, I think is, is very important. But in, in terms of hands off management, we know so much already about these animals. We know what the right thing to do is, and it's nothing to do with science at all. It's all to do with politics and economics. I have a question for Francis. Um, 
you mentioned harmful algal blooms and the impacts on um, on sea lions, and I'm wondering this confluence of climate change, ocean heat waves, and harmful algal blooms, if there's like multiple effects that you're seeing with the sea lions beyond the domoic acid. Um, yes, and there's sort of two ways to take that question. So within, with sea lions, we are seeing multiple effects, and that's why I think this concept of individual health versus population health is so fascinating because as, as uh, managers, we say, well, the population's healthy because it's 200,000 and increasing. But um, one in five of dead um, adult sea lions that I necropsy has cancer, and it's a widely metastatic cancer. Um, it's in the reproductive tract. It's, it spreads to, to um, lymph nodes, and they die because they're paralyzed. So, you know, uh, if we had a human population with a 20% cancer rate, we would think something is really wrong with that environment. And they're eating things that we eat, the variety of shared seafood. And we do know that there are still high levels of DDTs, um, PCBs, in the Southern California Bight, where most of the feeding occurs um, for females when they're foraging off the rookeries. And we've done some work showing that animals that die of cancer have higher levels of um, PCBs and DDTs than animals dying from other causes. So that's there. Um, and then we also know from some experimental studies with zebrafish that if you expose zebrafish to DDTs and then to domoic acid, they're much more sensitive to the effects of domoic acid. Domoic acid is a neurotoxin, binds to glutamate receptors in mostly brain, but also heart and muscle. And if the brain has been sensitized to DDT during development, there's a much greater binding of domoic acid and these animals have a lower threshold and they'll have seizures at a lower dose rate. So um, that might explain why we see more mortality of sea lions versus other species um, from domoic acid. And then from the harmful algal blooms, generally, um, the first time we recognized domoic acid as a cause of a marine mammal die-off was in 1998. But since then, there have been blooms almost every year on the West Coast. And then um, in the year associated with the blob, there was a, a, a harmful algal bloom, a red tide producing domoic acid that extended right up to, to the bearing. Um, and there are levels of domoic acid in every marine mammal species tested off the West Coast, um, including gray whales, um, including humpbacks. And so we know that these, these harmful algal blooms are becoming... They're longer lasting, they're more prevalent, they're pretty much in every ocean of the world. So it's not just ocean warming and um, eutrophication of coastal waters, but also our friend, the shipping industry with ballast water moves vast amounts of water regularly um, across oceans. So we're seeing some of the algae that had never been reported before in some seas appearing in other places. So it really is another emerging, emerging health problem. Uh, we'll take the next question for the third row. Hi, Vindia Kuluru from the Globe and Mail. Um, Joseph, you mentioned non-invasive techniques. Um, is there enough data to support that non-invasive techniques are effective, and is the data strong enough to inform policies? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think with some of the non-invasive information gathering techniques, we have great data on that. So you can use a drone to collect a breast sample and look at antibiotic resistant bacteria, look for signs of, of infection and things like that. People can use dogs to find feces and then check to see what hormone levels are and things like that. So I think that the, the, there are great opportunities to use non-invasive data collection. I think when you start treating animals and individual animals, that's when it gets a lot more challenging. And so in the case of J50, as much as people poor mouth uh, captive industry, we, we relied on people that had captive uh, killer whales to say, hey, this is an antibiotic that we've used before. This is what we know about the pharmacokinetics of that antibiotic. How long can you expect it to use that it is safe? And so we were able to use information that came from the captive industry to, to, to use to treat the wild animals. So I'll just add one more thing. The most classic, long, longest-running non-invasive technique is taking photographs of individual animals. So you see the white spots on this guy. They vary for each individual. So the non-invasive technique of par excellence for the North Atlantic right whale has been the catalog that the New England Aquarium has maintained and all of us have contributed to since about 1980. 
And so in that way, we don't rely solely on body counts from aerial surveys or whatever. We know what individuals' animals have done, their life history, their parentage, their grandparentage, and their offsprings. And to get a sense of the individual-based uh, health effects of entanglement and, and other things has been basically fundamentally driven by that carefully curated long-term catalogue of non-invasive non photographs. And the photographs, beyond all else, have been the basis of the management and the policy, such as it is, for, the, for that species and for the killer whale, too. I wonder if there's any um, information about the health of the orcas or links that could be made to the health of the orcas when there was a larger gray whale population. And just curious about that ecosystem change, if there's info or thoughts. More killer whales. I think that's a really interesting question. You're sort of getting at when there were more gray whales, there were also I mean, grey whales have been increasing since commercial whaling um, was stopped. And killer whales were also... I mean, the killer whales, we have different populations of killer whales. We have the transients that eat other marine mammals, so they eat grey whales. And um, then we have the resident ones that we're concerned about here that are, are really a remnant population at the southern part of their range. Um, so... You know, there was a time when the transient killer whales were eating grey whales, but not only were they eating gray, any old grey whale, they were often, um, it's believed that they were eating grey whales that, that commercial whalers had taken the skin, they'd, they'd killed a whale, they'd taken off the skin and blubber to use to render for fat, and the carcass that was left was um, fed off, the, the transient killer whales were then eating those carcasses. So with the end of whaling, that availability of sort of pre flans carcasses um, disappeared. And so some of those killer whales then shifted prey and began to eat other things. So they ate maybe sea otters or they ate um, small dolphins. So that may have led to some real changes in the ecosystem in the, um, uh, along the Aleutian Islands and up in the very far northwest. Um, this conversation, we're, we're talking about the southern residents um, when their population was larger, um, they, they could afford to lose, if you like, maybe a male hit by a ship or maybe a young male eaten um, uh, or just traumatized or, or taken by a shark. But once the population has got so small, this is now a population that has a limited number of grandmothers left. The grandmothers are vital for um, uh, foraging history, for the social support for the young calves. So they simply um, numerically have gotten to a point that they can't afford to... They, it's far harder than to recover if a, a single animal dies from a random event like a, like a ship strike. I'm not sure that quite answers your questions, but there's some complexities with the one population going up, one coming down, and then now being vulnerable to stochastic events as distinct from just large ecosystem processes. There's also a broader perspective. The whole business of ecosystem services from large whales that's been in the news quite a lot recently. You could look at whales as the sort of Yellowstone wolves of the sea, the bison, the buffalo, and all of the services that they do to sustaining a broad and diverse and productive ecosystem that we've lost by the loss of not only grey whales but all the other large whale species too, and how, how little we know about that. And you know, one of the questions, well, who cares about the North Atlantic right? Well, well, who cares because we don't know the answer to that. And that's a critical piece to it, that you, you need to be able to recognize that we can't act like God over all of these animals because in so doing, we will inevitably impoverish the global ecosystem as a whole. Yes. Hi, my name's Jessica. I'm a science writer for Boston University. Um, I'm curious if there's more data research around how ocean noise pollution affects individual like populations and species um, and how, yeah, just what we know there and how that kind of varies between different parts of the world and between different species of whales. 
I could start. Uh, take a look at the work that Susan Parks has done. She's at Syracuse now. She was at Hui. And she looked at the frequency at which North Atlantic right whales communicate. And she showed that as the ocean noise background level went up, they changed the frequency with which they communicate so they could still be heard in the cocktail party. And I think that's really dramatic in that regard. Uh, Chris Clark has done a bunch of work on uh, masking of, you know, say on Stellwagen Bank or around Boston there, uh, as the ships go by, and they've got real-time recordings of both the whales communicating with each other and the ships and how the cloud of noise completely blankets that out. So those are two examples for that species that I'm aware of, but I'm not an acoustician, so I don't want to give you a sort of authoritative answer, but I can tell you that both of those studies are well supported. And, and it, you know, it's very hard to actually say, okay, fine, what is the uh, acoustic stress uh, impact? And obviously they're exposed, but what's the dose and what's the effect? Well, one study that was done before and after 9-11 where uh, there was a 48-hour period of no shipping in the Bay of Fundy and they had been looking at the fecal steroid, corticosteroid levels, they dropped dramatically over um, <coughs> the period of silence when the ships weren't running. So that, that I think, is... You know, if you look at what uh, you know, multiple childhood stresses do, the ACE syndrome, that whole story, I think that's going on right there in the ocean as well. And all the work that the folks have been doing on ACEs in children have belong to be looked at with, right, with, with coastal waters that have got a lot of noise because it's an urban environment. We published a book called The Urban Whale about the right whale, and it's, it is an urban environment. And the same thing uh, is going on with... Uh, um Southern resident killer whales is here, they do this masking. So as the ambient noise increases, their calls increase. And, and as uh, Michael alluded to, they do the same thing that we do at a cocktail party. They speak slower and louder um, when that noise is present. And there are people that have actually worked to show that that increase in uh, effort to speak is actually an energy consumer. So it takes energy for them to do that. And then the people have also showed that they've, they're, how many hours, they've calculated how many hours of foraging time are they losing because the ship noise is so high in the area. And then um, the, the last uh, component of, of that um, is that right now what we don't know legally we know what a take is for an endangered species, but we don't, what we don't have is a certain level of ocean noise that we can classify as a take to a degradation of the habitat. And so this is kind of a legal decision that needs to happen with acousticians and lawyers right now to say, with our Endangered Species Act, at what level is noise pollution in the ocean the same as what we would consider chemical pollution with DDT or things like that. And so we're just at that management level now where we need to start asking ourselves that question. If there are no further questions, we'll conclude the briefing. Thank you so much to our speakers for their time. This was a fascinating discussion. Uh, if anyone does have further questions, depending on the speaker availability, this room will be available for a little bit longer uh, because it is our last briefing of the day. Uh, so, and the, and the meeting. So uh, thank you so much to uh, all of our speakers and to all of our attendees for joining us in the newsroom and at the meeting. And we hope to see you next year in Phoenix. Thank you. Thank you.